All right, so uh, this is going to be the uh, cross-plane introduction and deep dive, but I got a bit of a combination of material here to hopefully uh, satisfy all different folks with their exposure to cross-plane so far. So my name is Jared, and then we also have uh, Nick, Bob, and Matthias here. Uh, we all contribute to the cross-plane project in one way or another. All right, so let's start with the intro stuff here first. So, you know, when you think about what crossplane is, the best way to think about it is that it's a framework. And you can use this framework to build a cloud native control plane. Uh, the intent is that you can do that in a declarative way, that you don't have to write any code. You can write code if you need to, uh, you know, to do more custom scenarios, but hopefully you can do this all in a declarative way and end up with a cloud native control plane. So, speaking of control planes, you know, the cloud providers, uh, they've obviously been using these, uh, they've been building control planes and using them to manage their infrastructure for years. You know, control plane isn't a brand new concept, but now with Crossplane though, we're hoping to enable you to be able to build your own control plane and put your own opinions into it. So if you think about the core Crossplane functionality uh, and the machinery, you know, there's two major extensibility areas to it. So it's on the back end, uh, Crossplane is extensible to be able to basically anything that has an API, uh, you know, all sorts of cloud infrastructure, let's say, um, you can teach Crossplane to manage that infrastructure in any environment. So that's the extensible back end. And then on the front end, you have an uh, extensibility story for being able to compose together infrastructure and then surface that to your application developers with your own abstraction. Uh, you know, the, the expose the configuration uh, fields and knobs that you want to and basically help your developers have self-service abilities to provision their own infrastructure. All right. So, you know, this is a CNCF project, right? This is the maintainer track. This is, um, you know, it is a community project. Uh, and so we think of it as a neutral place for people to come together and enable and move forward control planes. So this project's been around for a little bit. We first uh, open sourced it back in uh, late 2018. We are the same folks that created the Rook project uh, as well, storage orchestration for Kubernetes. So some of you may be familiar with that as well. And then a little bit of history, uh, we've, we donated it to the CNCF at the sandbox level, like the middle of 2020. Uh, and then we got to the, by the end of 2020, we're at our stable, uh, first V1 stable milestone, declared it ready for production usage. Uh, and then by the late 2021, we we're at the incubation level. Just last week, we released our latest release, which is the V1.10 release. So the Crossplane project's still moving and, and making progress. And then our next thing that we've got our sights on is uh, sometime in early 2023, we want to be moving to the full graduation uh, with the CNCF. We will need your help on that, uh, the whole community and ecosystem, and we'll uh, talk about that a little bit later. Uh, so, you know, stats, numbers, um, the biggest thing for this here, for me, is the number of contributions for people, right? We've got lots of people in this room that have been contributing to the project, writing code, opening issues, giving feedback, and this project is nothing without the community behind it. All right, so let's start with some the basic functionality of managed resources in Crossplane. So we talked about, you know, Crossplane can manage any infrastructure uh, in any environment. An example of this here is, let's talk about AWS. So AWS has something like, I don't know, 700, 800 um, services that they offer. Uh, they've got a whole lot of stuff, a lot of great engineers building a lot of cool stuff. So basically, you know, using Crossplane, you can represent and bring all of those cloud infrastructure and services, anything with an API, you can bring that into the Kubernetes control plane and manage it, provision, and create all that infrastructure from Kubernetes. So, you know, networking, databases, certificates, queues, caches, buckets, whatever, all that sort of stuff, you can, from the Kubernetes control plane, provision it and manage it. And so how do we do that? Uh, well, probably like you expect, we represent all of these cloud provider resources and you know, infrastructure, et cetera, as objects in the Kubernetes API. So what we're looking at here on the screen is uh, a Kubernetes API object uh, with Crossplane that represents an S3 bucket. So you know, just like any other Kubernetes objects, such as a you know, deployment, pod, config map, whatever, uh, it's got a spec where you know, that takes in the desired state, all the configuration, how do you want to create this bucket? You know, you can specify all that, that desired state in the spec of this bucket object, and Crossplane will make that happen for you. Similarly, uh, you know, with, um, 
Oh yeah. So similarly with uh, you know the, the common shape of Kubernetes API objects, they've got a spec for desired state, they've got a status for some of that actual state, the observed state too, right? So everything is going to be um, represented with both spec and status. So we observe things in the cloud provider APIs or whatever infrastructure Crossplane's watching, and then surfaces that back up as status fields, and then just like uh, many good API objects in Kubernetes, they'll generate events as well that tells the story of that infrastructure. How did it get provisioned okay? Did it run into an issue? Is it operating healthy, et cetera? Those events will tell you the story. Okay, and then just quick implementation detail here. Uh, so this probably works exactly how you would expect it to work as well. So you've on the left of the screen, let's go left to right, you've got uh, an API object, a manifest, you know, YAML, whatever, that represents an Amazon RDS database. And so you've got the spec there, you're specifying some of your desired configuration, desired state, you apply that, to the Kubernetes API server. Um, you can do that with Kube Control Apply, or you can do that with um, you know, a GitOps methodology, but Flux, Argo, whatever. It gets applied to the API server. There's a specific controller that's uh, you know, for Amazon RDS that's watching the API server, gets an event, sees that somebody is requesting the creation of an RDS database, and then it uses the Amazon, the AWS API, to talk to AWS and actually make that uh, desired state of an RDS database, you know, actual, makes it happen in the real world. So that's a bit of the architecture. And then one more detail on that is this uh, tech stack here. So from the bottom, you know, we're, we're building, this is building on, you know, the Kubernetes runtime, Kubernetes API machinery, right? And then, you know, on top of that, the controller runtime is uh, what we use to more quickly accelerate the, uh, how we build controllers in Crossplane. And we get a lot of nice functionality there that helps us implement reconciliation of cloud provider resources. On top of that, we've built a opinionated specific Crossplane runtime uh, that helps ex further accelerate the implementation of uh, controllers and reconciliation of managed resources, cloud provider resources, infrastructure stuff, uh, you know, within Crossplane. And then the top layer are the, all the controllers for you know, RDS, DynamoDB, GK, you know, GKE, whatever, all those resources, they each have a controller that's built on this stack. So I'll go ahead and pass it off to my colleague Matthias now to talk about the next uh, bit of functionality in Crossplane. All right. So, so far what Jared has been talking about is getting uh, uh, the API of something like an S3 bucket, RES instance, what you, you name it, uh, also other cloud providers into your system. Then the next level is that we want to compose them uh, together. So um, we want to enable building your own platform, um, a, a platform API, right? So that is using the existing granular resources and composing them to, you know, something bigger, something that uh, you, uh, you want to offer to your developers. Um, this can be from multiple clouds, right? That is like a, a typical example. And it's higher level um, uh, APIs. And these can be any, anything, right? That's on your decision. We have a couple of examples. Um, but I guess, you know, uh, it's, it's also up to the community to come up with good examples. Um, and I know that some folks uh, talked to yesterday is like, oh, I have this very opinionated version of it. Like, is anyone interested? And it's like, yes, we are interested in these, right? Because we need to, uh, as a community, learn on how we're building these. So there's, um, you compose these into, um, you know, higher level uh, APIs and offer them as a single API to the developer, which we're going to see um, in, a, in a second. This is all uh, decorative, de de and um, so there is uh, uh, lots of YAML fun. So um, conceptually, you can think about this like you know high levelly like this, right? We have like these managed resources that Jared has just talked about, and they all are bundled into a provider, right? So they have you have this AWS provider, GKE, uh, GCP provider, and, and etc. And then you compose them together. But you offer this, you offer the API with an XRD, um, and the developer uh, claims it uh, with a specific uh, typed claim that you, that you have defined. So just as one example, right, so a developer would say, I, will, I would like to have a small uh, Postgres uh, instance, and uh, this, you know, is defined how this looks like in the XRD. And here we have a like, specific AWS composition that, you know, takes, you know, configures it how you as a platform developer uh, would put it together. 
no. Yep. All right. So the first thing that you need to do is create a, a composite resource. Um, this is like a composite resource definition or XRD. CRD was taken, so we, we went for the X. Um, and we put them all, all together. Um, so you have your, for example, you have your custom API group that you can define um, you know, with the uh, usual uh, uh, ways of doing it. Um, and you have a standard open uh, API v3 schema where you define on how, this, how your API looks like. On the composition slide is then is like, okay, how does it actually work, right? So I said like as an example, this would be the AWS example. So you take the uh, list, you, you take all the managed resources uh, that you want to compose into a high level uh, API, you reference the XRD that, your, uh, that this composition works for, um, and yeah, you, you, you get all the compositions, uh, all the managed resources together. Um, and you need to propagate uh, information, um, and we do this by this patching mechanism. Um, and there you have, you know, uh, ways of uh, propagating the information um, and transforming the information. This is the current way we're of doing it, and Nick is going to show in a minute um, uh, a new way um, of also doing this, like, uh, yeah, in, in, in different ways. So... This is about compositions, right? And these are the two things that you need to do. <clears throat> but obviously, you don't want to do all this by hand. You want to use uh, existing uh, packages, existing extensions. Uh, so, um, you know, if, if, we, if we think about extending cross-plane, there's currently two ways, two major building blocks that, that, that are relevant. Cross-plane, as uh, Jared has said, is an extensible framework. So we have two building blocks uh, that, you, that, that you can reason about. The first one is, is a provider. Um, uh, there's basically, you know, provider for, for everything. Uh, the, the easiest way is, again, the, the clouds that you can reason about, but also specific services, uh, specific uh, other uh, smaller clouds, all, all very different ways of, of uh, uh, very different providers for all sorts of things. We also have uh, code generation for these providers. Uh, so you don't, uh, you know, you, you can take existing ways of talking to an API and generate uh, uh, pro providers out of it. The second part is configurations, and that's where we are uh, using existing providers. So you have some kind of dependency uh, a way of saying, okay, I, I need one, uh, multiple providers, and then you bundle all the compositions uh, that we've seen before into its own package. And that way, you have like a single deployable unit that you can um, hand over, that you can reason about, uh, that you can collaborate on um, of how you would use a specific, uh, a specific API and how, uh, you know, share that, share that with others. Um, yeah. both, um, both packages are uh, uh, just OCI images, uh, so there's a spec behind it, but it's basically just uh, YAML layers in an OCI image. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a nice spec around it if you're interested in that. Uh, we've got a pretty good uh, provider ecosystem. Um, we have many providers from the community. There's, uh, you know, daily there's uh, something new coming. Um, and we have uh, just launched a marketplace and that is uh, open for everyone. Uh, so we, uh, from Upbound, we have specific providers that we offer, but we are not gating this in any way, right? So this is open for the community. Uh, so if you have a provider and, uh, or if you think about a provider, please come to me, talk to me, we're happy to help. Um, and, you know, listing them in the marketplace just, you know, uh, gives the community, you know, a great, great way uh, to reason about these, find these um, and collaborate on these. Um, with that said, I'll hand it over to Nick. All right. Hey, folks. I'm Nick, uh, Senior Principal Engineer at Upbound and a uh, longtime cross-plane maintainer. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a new feature that we're hoping to land in uh, cross-plane 0.11, which I guess is due in about a quarter from now. We just released 0.10. Sorry, 1.11. We just released 1.10. So this functionality is uh, intended to extend and give some more power and flexibility to how people do composition in Crossplane. So as Matthias mentioned earlier, uh, you know I I'll go over this uh, context pretty quickly because Matthias touched on it. But 
in Crossplane, you can define your own API types. So this is an example of one of those. This is an XR. Matthias talked about this a moment ago. This is defined by an XRD, a composite resource definition. And the idea here is that you, for your org, let's say you're a platform team at Acmeco, and maybe you want to let your developers provision databases, but you want to take away a lot of the knobs, and you want to just say all that developers really care about are what's the storage size for this contrived simple example. This is how they could do that. You define the schema of this resource, and then you teach Crossplane what to do when Crossplane sees one of these resources. Now, as Matthias mentioned, you teach Crossplane what to do using a composition. Historically, as uh, Matthias already touched on, a composition has an array of resources, effectively resource templates, and then it can patch and transform values. Now, what this means is it can copy values effectively from the instance of a composite resource into the composed resources. So in this case, we're saying, Crossplane, when you see an Acme code database, what we really want you to do is make a Cloud SQL instance in GCP. Now, it doesn't have to just be one resource. It could be a Cloud SQL instance and a firewall rule or something like that. But in this case, we're keeping it simple. And then you can say, all right, Crossplane, you can see the patches uh, towards the bottom there. Take that storage gig value and copy that into this other path, basically, the settings.datadisksize meg. And then you can also transform that. You can basically say, all right, in this case, you know, multiply it to turn it from, uh, from gig to meg. Now, when we designed this API type, we very intentionally kept it as limited as possible. We did not want to grow a DSL in YAML, something that tries to compete with a general purpose programming language. And speaking as someone who's been a platform engineer in SRE for my entire career, I kind of know that it's really easy to fall into the temptation of, oh, I just need this feature from this language. I just need feature X or feature Y. I'll add it on, I'll bolt it on, and then you have this really sort of incoherent, weird configuration file. So we decided to try and be as conservative as possible. We designed this for relatively simple use cases. So things that you can't do today in composition in Crossplane, for example, includes conditionals. You can't say, if this input, then make this resource, otherwise don't, or do this patch, otherwise don't. You can't do iteration in composition today. And so you can't say uh, if there are five resources, uh, sorry, if, uh, if the spec is five, then make five subnets or something like that. That's not possible in Crossplane today. So our idea was that we always wanted to give people the ability to use their uh, existing tooling that they're comfortable with, or a general purpose programming language that they're comfortable with, in order to do more advanced composition use cases. So this kind of balances no code with low code, basically. If you have a simple use case, it's no code. You write one of these. But if you start to get a little bit more complex, then we really do think the best thing to do is either, you know, I guess it doesn't have to be code. You could use a programming language, but you could also use something like Helm inside of Crossplane, for example, and I'll touch on that now. So this is, this is what we call composition functions. You can see that in this example, instead of the array of resources, an array of resource templates, there's an array of functions. In this case, the function is an OCI container. Now, this can be mixed and matched with the resource template, which is pretty nice, so you could actually do both. You could have the example from the previous slide. You could say, I'd like you to just make a simple Cloud SQL instance. But then maybe I have to go and talk to an IPAM, an IP address allocation, service to figure out what subnet I should put it in or something like that. And that's something that you can't do with a simple YAML file in composition today, but you could do with a function. So the idea is this allows you to decorate your existing compositions with additional functionality or just replace them with additional functionality. So it touches on a couple of use cases. It touches on, you know, maybe you just don't like YAML very much, which I know is a, you know, a pretty common thing. And maybe you prefer to use a real programming language. Or maybe you have a tool that you're familiar with already. Maybe you really like Helm, or you really like JSONnet, or you really like QLang, or something like that. And you would like to use those to do your, uh, your composition for you. But you'd like to do that server side. That's, that's one of the neat things about Crossplane, right? You don't have to get everyone to go and run Helm on their laptop, for example. Crossplane can go and do it for you. Server side is behind an API. So people are still, your developers that you're supporting, still make an API call. They don't, they don't know how this is implemented on the back end, they don't need to know. They just say, I need an Acme code database, and then you specify what Crossplane should do. So this is a bit of a sneak preview in how we think that uh, these functions will be implemented. Uh, 
uh, shout out to the folks uh, who worked on uh, KRM functions in customize and KPT. That was a uh, definitely a big influence here. So we're following a similar pattern where we think that there might be different kinds of functions in future. For instance, you could imagine a webhook function, right, that uh, just you know basically calls out to webhook and says, what should I do to compose these resources? Uh, but to start with, we're thinking we'll use OCI containers. The idea is you containerize a process. The process takes uh, a standard input on its standard input, actually, a, as in a standard this YAML document on its uh, standard input, and then uh, can optionally mutate this YAML document and is expected to return it to standard out. And this allows a pipeline of functions. It allows you to stack them effectively with each one mutating the, the state of the world. You can see in this, uh, in this document, you've got a config for the function, which is basically just an arbitrary uh, uh, XRM or KRM document that you can use optionally to, uh, to configure your function. And then it will show you, in this case, this is kind of the input to the first function, so it'll show you the observed state of the world. It says, hey, there's this composite resource. In this case, it's called an X Postgres instance and it's got 20 gig of storage. What should I do function? And then the function, it's not pictured here, but can set the desired state of the world, which looks very similar to this. It might say, set the status conditions ready true, which is already there. We'll set the status conditions maybe ready false and go compose a Cloud SQL instance by outputting that. It returns this on the standard out, then Crossplane sees that and says, oh, all right, I need to go make a Cloud SQL instance or whatever. So we expect this to be alpha in V0.11. It's probably gonna be off by default uh, as all of our alpha features are. You know, I expect that there's gonna be limited scaffolding for building these functions at first, but this is definitely something that we wanna have. We're imagining having, you know, CLI tooling, SDKs, all that kind of thing to make these, uh, make building these functions easier. And we really hope that this is going to open Crossplane up to some more advanced composition functionality that will help more people as they migrate away from other tools to Crossplane, uh, be able to do what they need to do. And we also hope it's gonna be a bit of a proving ground. We're, not, we're definitely not saying that we won't extend sort of patch and transform style composition as well. But the nice thing is with this in place, there's always an escape hatch. We can take our time and we can grow the composition language as it exists today, slowly and carefully and intentionally. And meanwhile, people can still do what they need to do using these functions. So we really hope that they're gonna coexist together well. Uh, the first version of the container runner, this is a quick illustration of it. We actually think there's gonna be multiple different container runners. Uh, if anyone's worked with or on Argo workflows, you've probably seen that it's surprisingly hard to get Kubernetes to run a pipeline of containers in order, passing input to, uh, to passing output to input in a sort of fast and performant way. So we're thinking that Crossplane's going to ship with a sidecar container that will actually use rootless containers to run these inside it, run little snippets of uh, these, uh, these sort of function containers inside it. But we do imagine that this is gonna be a pluggable situation. So if you wanted to go and build maybe a more scalable function runner that's you know, secure, built on Firecracker or GVisor or something like that, absolutely possible as well. This is gonna be kind of just like the, the default one that ships with Crossplane so that you can have something that works out of the box without having to spin up a ton of infrastructure. All right, and now I'll pass you on to Bob to talk about garbage collection in Crossplane. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bob Hamilton. I work for Nokia and uh, been contributing to Crossplane for about six months or so. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about the garbage collect deletion processing and garbage collection issues that we've run into um, and some of the work that's been going on to, to try to improve this area. Um, one thing we found was that managed resources um, can fail to delete, and you, you as the user, the claim, the person that put the claim in and presumably deleted the claim, you may not know that that deletion failed. Um, one thing I realized we didn't talk about much was the processing of you know, how you create things. Well, Kubernetes is going to create everything that you tell it to using eventual consistency. Um, it's going to follow a path um, of resource creation that is undefined and undefinable, pretty much. Um, and it's also not stored anywhere. So we don't know the order that things got created in. And as things stand today, there is no defined order for deleting resources. Um, so um, we found that because the resources just kind of delete as they go, um, your managed resources might get stuck in some situations. 
Um, we also found that foreground deletion on uh, composites does, didn't work for a couple of reasons. Um, mainly the block owner deletion field in the, in the controller owner reference wasn't set to true. Um, and then the other issue is that the claim itself is namespaced, um, but the composite that is associated with that claim is cluster scoped. And what that means in Kubernetes world is that you cannot have an owner reference field from the composite pointing back at the claim. So now Kubernetes has no way of associating the deletion of the claim with the deletion of all of the other resources underneath the claim. Crossplane has to handle that itself. So the resource relationships, real quick, um, as I said, the claim is namespaced. It has a reference to the composite object that is, that is associated with it. So when you create the claim, Crossplane will see that claim and it will create an associated composite. That composite has a claim reference pointing back at the claim. Um, as I said, the, um, there's no owner reference there. The composite then creates other composites or other managed resources as you tell it to. Um, and all of those are cluster scoped. So all of those have owner references that point back up. Eventually, you'll get back up to that root composite. Each one of the types, the claim, composite, and managed resources, have reconcilers associated with them. Those reconcilers have finalizers that they've placed on the resources to prevent them from being deleted. Crossplane is gonna manage the deletion of those resources when Kubernetes tells it to. So just as an example of a default claim processing, uh, delete processing, and this is, this is what happens today um, and will continue uh, for this type of example, when you do cube control delete on the claim, Kubernetes will put a deletion timestamp on the metadata for that claim. Um, it does some other things too, but for our purposes, that's enough. The claim reconciler will detect that deletion timestamp and it will call the API delete function for the composite, because again, Kubernetes has no way of doing that directly. The composite then gets a delete timestamp. The claim reconciler, meanwhile, goes on and finishes its work. Right, so the claim is now gone, cube, cube control delete is done. So as a user, you have no idea what else is going on at this point. You think everything is, is deleted. The deletion timestamp that shows up on the composite, kind of in parallel with everything else, triggers Kubernetes to go follow those owner references, generate a graph, follow those owner references, and mark, basically call API delete on all of those sub-resources. The Reconcilers will then detect those deletions and do their appropriate processing. So the composite reconciler will detect the deletion of the composite. It will remove the connection details resource that's associated with the composite, and then it will remove its finalizer, which will allow the object to be deleted. The managed resources, the managed reconciler will call whatever delete function is associated with that managed resource, whether it's a delete VPC or a delete EC2 instance or whatever it is, once that's done, it will remove its finalizer, and those objects can get deleted. And that all happens basically at random, you know, you have no control over it. All those things just kind of happen, and everything goes away. Which is great, until you have one or five or ten managed resources that, for whatever reason, the, the far end of your API can't delete. Maybe somebody spun up an EC2 instance on your subnet and didn't tell you about it, which wasn't very nice, but it happens. And now your subnet can't be deleted because somebody else has an EC2 instance sitting out there on it, right? That's what gets you into this situation. At that point, you have two choices, basically. You can either go find the EC2 instance and delete it and let reconciliation do its thing. Um, you can also remove the finalizer, but I would not recommend that because now your subnet is left out there hanging in. in whatever cloud provider you've got. So that's kind of the, an illustration of the problem that we were looking at. In 1.10, we added support for foreground cascading deletion. Um, and I wanna qualify that a little bit. It's simulated on the claim side. It's implemented for the composite side. Um, the claim reconciled, we have a composite delete policy that we added to the claim. So you can tell the claim, when you delete that composite, use foreground cascading deletion. And I'll show you that example in a minute. The default is still background. It's still gonna operate exactly the same way it does today. Um, the other thing we did was we set block owner deletion on all the controller owner references so that foreground cascading deletion will work the way we expect it to. 
Um, you can delete a standalone composite. Uh, we haven't talked about it really, but you, there's no requirement to use a claim. You can implement, you can instantiate the composites directly. Uh, that's entirely a user decision. Um, this change will allow foreground cascading deletion to work on composites. Um, the, uh, the other piece here is that if you specify the cascading foreground, cascading deletion policy on a claim deletion, it's still ignored like it is today. And that's, cause, that's the owner reference issue. So the same example that we just ran, this time we're setting the foreground composite deletion policy. Same thing's gonna happen to set the deletion timestamp. The claim reconciler is gonna do its thing. You'll notice the claim stays at this point. At this point, you've got an additional finalizer on all of the composite resources. Anything that has an owner reference pointed to it um, has an uh, a final, additional finalizer on it. The managed resources are gonna go ahead and delete the way they do today. The composite that now has no owner references pointing to it will also get deleted. But your stuck mobile uh, managed resource is now going to block the deletion of everything up the tree behind it. So now your cube control command doesn't return, nothing gets deleted until you go in and you fix this, and you now say, oh, I have a stuck resource. Now I delete my EC2 instance, it's blocking my subnet, and now everything cascades out. Um, the next step on top of this is kind of going on now in terms of determining the um, deletion order, and we've got a couple of POCs going on using Kyverno to try to simulate that. So, um, Jared. All right, sweet. So let's go ahead and start closing this thing out now. Uh, so the final thing I wanted to say, once again, you know, kind of uh, reinforce this, is that you know this project is nothing without its community, right? And so uh, you know, I, I definitely wanted to make sure that we give some uh, opportunities here for everyone to start getting involved. Uh, there's a whole bunch of useful links here. Uh, you know, the main website is crossplane.io. You can go there, read the docs, uh, get the quick start. Uh, you know, start trying it out on your own. And we are always around on Slack, uh, Slack as well. So our crossplane Slack, Slack, we're hanging out there. We're ready to answer questions and talk and hang out. Uh, and so the last thing I wanted to mention is that, uh, you know, as uh, we are trying to progress to the graduated state with the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and so one thing that we need your help with for that is uh, essentially hearing about your adoption, your success, your challenges, et cetera. So I've got a little survey uh, here that, uh, you know, me as, a, as the maintainer in the steering committee uh, will love to collect this information, hear it from you all, connect with you, and then be able to kind of put that into our graduation proposal with the CNCF as well and kind of share the story of the success and growth of our community together. Uh, so I'm going to leave this here on the screen, so you can use a little QR code thing there to go to that uh, survey if you want to, and uh, and help us out all get to graduation. And so that with that, questions? Anybody? Oh, I saw that hand go first for sure. That was fast. Uh, there's definitely no plans at the moment to remove it. it uh, so technically, anything that goes into Crossplane as alpha could be removed. That's kind of part of that contract, but there's no intention. I think the only reason we would remove it is if we added it and it turned out to be a terrible idea and everyone hated it or it didn't work or something like that. So I hope it stays there, but uh, no contract around that until it hits V1, basically. So Crossplane manages the cloud provider, Crossplane providers, right? And I was wondering what Crossplane does to stay up to date with, you know, all the updates of all the cloud, cloud provider APIs. Um, and why not use like Azure Service Operator, or Google Config Connector, um, and let them manage it kind of. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> that's a great question and obviously a challenge. Uh, so first of all, I think uh, the community done, has done a great job and keeps doing a great job of creating these providers, uh, the community providers, and we see this left and right, and I encourage everyone to, to contribute there. Uh, we also have code generation, as I said, um, and that's, this code generation works on top of Terraform providers, so it takes an existing Terraform provider and creates 
creates a, a cross-plane provider. Um, and we've, we've done this from the upbound side for the major uh, uh, providers, but um, everyone can do them, and we're seeing this, that others are also using this. And the way that I try to think about it, uh, the vision would be that the cross-plane provider at the end of the day is just a build artifact uh, out of the Terraform provider. Now, this doesn't need to be the end, right? We're also looking into other code generation mechanisms um, of, of other things, but, that, but that's the current state, and that's why we are uh, confident that we, every resource is there or is, is, can be generated in a very, very fast way. Just to, just to add on to that real quick as well, the specific around like why not use Azure Service Operator, KCC, ACK, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's a couple of things. One is API consistency. Uh, yes, all of those things are bounded by the KRM, but uh, you know, we work pretty closely, uh, collaborate with the folks who work on those teams because we're all doing similar work and it's great to swap notes. Uh, and you know, KCC just has different annotations and different settings from, from ACK, right? So if you're using multiple providers, it's just nicer to have them be consistent. I think the other thing as well is that that only covers the big three clouds. You know, we have providers for GitHub, GitLab, SQL, Terraform to run Terraform, um, tons of other things, right? So if we just said, you, you could maybe make the case, oh, we'll just use operators, any operator sort of thing, but this just becomes really inconsistent and it's just a lot for cross-plane sort of administrators to have to understand. So it's nice to have the consistency of having our own sort of uh, standards there, basically. All right, that's all the time we have there, but thanks again for showing up and uh, looking to see in the community. Thanks, guys.